Hi, I'm Michael Clark coming to you from a parking lot in Drumheller, Alberta, and we're going to take a step up and take a look at the 2013 Ford F-150, which looks an awful lot like the 2012. Now, you have to wonder why did they go to the need to have an event to showcase the 2013 F-150? Well, there's a reason, and it has to do with what I like to call reminders, because Sometimes we drive these vehicles and of course they go through minimal changes and we start to forget about their capabilities. Well, the reason that Ford invited us to Drumheller is to show off what an F-150 can actually do when it comes to towing and also off-road capabilities. So what better place than Alberta? Now, this particular one here, well, it's one of the trucks I've been dying to drive, and it's the 3.7 liter naturally aspirated V6. This is the V6 engine that you get as the base model engine, and also it can be had with two or four wheel drive. So we're excited to actually finally get behind this, as well as the other engines that we're going to have here for testing. Now the 3.5 liter EcoBoost, well we know that it's doing absolutely incredible. It has blown away all possible expectations when it comes to both sales as well as performance. But the one thing we found with the EcoBoost is that it's great if you're running around unladen. How's it going to do when it comes to economy when you're going to be putting a trailer behind it? Well, in the ones that we tested over the years, it's actually been a little thirsty. So People have definitely pointed that out to us, and they're wondering, what is Ford going to do to get some additional efficiencies? Plus, we have to remember that the Ford Atlas concept, well, that's drawing away a lot of the excitement right now when it comes to F-150. So what can you do with a truck that is basically waiting to be redone? Well, there's a lot of things that are going to be taken a look at and when we think about programming when we think about just those slight little adjustments and they may be nothing that we can actually point the finger at but if it means that we're going to be getting efficiencies that are simply not reserved for trucks like this particular 3.7 v6 which in the drive in from calgary to drumheller well it's actually been averaging low 11 liters per 100 kilometers it's still a truck and that's pretty darn impressive. But the thing we have to remember is that the competition is continuing to get fierce. We think of Ram 1500 with the eight speed automatics. We think of the coming 2014 Silverado and the Sierra with direct injection. What, who's putting direct injection on pushrod engines? Well, GM is going to, and they're already talking about how their V8 is going to do better in both capacity as well as economy than the EcoBoost. That's fighting words, and I'd have to say that Ford wants to remind the people out there how good an EcoBoost engine is. And we see how well it's doing in all of the other different derivatives of Ford products, from Fusion sedans to Escape SUVs, even the Fiesta. It's going to be getting a one liter EcoBoost three cylinder engine. Do you think that EcoBoost maybe has a chance of sticking around for a while? Well, we'd have to say yes. But we're going to tell you a little bit more about what the F-150 can do here in Alberta. And if you've got questions, thoughts, or feelings about anything automotive, send us an email at honkyourhorn at live.ca. And listen to the road trip every Saturday on 680 CJOB from 10 till noon for the latest in car news. So we've seen a, a great trend in trucks that customers are asking for more and more luxury in their trucks. So both their creature comforts and just aesthetics. Um, I, and I think that trend comes from the fact that, that our customers are really using their trucks. They're driving their trucks. They're using them for work. They're using them for play. And they're in their vehicles a lot. And what we've seen is that those customers are looking to be more comfortable. They're looking to have great aesthetics. Um, and we've done very well with our Platinum Series, our King Ranch, our Lariat that has, you know, the nice leather seats. Um, we've now added my Ford Touch um, to those series, and, uh, and they continued to call for the high series. So we w in response to that, in 2013, we added the Limited Series, which really is, is our top of the line, um, very exclusive, uh, great brick 
red leather seats, uh, a very exclusive badging, um, all of the comforts you would expect in any vehicle, your telescoping steering wheel, um, our deployable uh, fold-down running boards, um, comes with our EcoBoost engine. Um, so great aesthetics, great creature comforts, um, comes with our, my Ford Touch, um, very nice trim series, and, uh, and everything a customer wants to be comfortable while they're really using their truck. So with Ford of Canada, we've actually sold a record-breaking 106,358 F-Series uh, trucks last year for 2012. And we're really seeing that success continue in 2013, with our year-to-date sales up 20% on F-Series. Uh, and for the month of April, we were actually up uh, staggering 53% on F-150 year-over-year. So a great story. I think what's helping uh, really drive a lot of that is our continuous improvement and the view that we never stand still and always want to make sure that we're providing our customers with exactly what they need uh, in their pickup truck buying experience. So we offer a wide range of uh, truck and trim levels with our XL truck, which is kind of our work spec, all the way up to our limited model that we're standing next to today. So we really have a full spectrum of, of trim levels, of cab styles, of drivetrains, of box lengths, uh, really a combination that allows any truck buyer to find exactly what they're looking for in the Ford showroom. Now, one of our favorite features when it comes to things F-150 has to be what they can hide in tailgates and we're talking about the rear step now it's obviously an option but it's one of the smartest options you need to think about if you're looking at an F-150 because not only do you get a step which makes so much sense to get in and out of the bed to access items but you also get this handy baluster I mean look look, look at this you can look downright classy downright classy getting into this thing and, and look at this you can reef on it it's got a pin it's got a big pin down there it's actually quite quite sturdy so you you can be using this in a really classy well let me try to explain how you could use this classy let's say you're a politician let's say you're the next Canadian Prime Minister let's say your last name's Trudeau let's say you want to go across Canada and you want to let the country know how much you care about them and what might be on their minds well imagine if you're in Alberta imagine you're around cows and cattle and other Alberta things and and as you get up to greet the throngs you do so on the back of a Ford F-150. Think about that. Think about what they could do for your image when it comes to what the other Trudeau did to well well know that story but <laughs> let's not worry ourselves with politics. Let's also remember that there's different trims of F-150 as we go through the line. We've got the XTR 4x4. Now you see this on a, a lot of the value type of F-150s. I mean, th these are the bread and butter trucks. These are the ones that people are actually buying. I mean, hey, we're not going to tell Ford to stop sending us things like platinum or lithium or whatever edition they're thinking about dreaming up next. This is the truck that is making the lion's share of sales. It's a sensible trim. I mean, we're talking XLT level. Which means we're not going to be dealing with leather at this particular one, but we're going to be getting very nice cloth interiors with it, very good capability, and a little bit of bright work. Hey, what's wrong with a little bit of bling? Now, I've got to tell you, when it comes to a step up, oh, you know, they're slippery. Now that is one of the slickest items out there. Now they're available in the aftermarket, but these side steps make so much sense. Because think about how you usually have to load things into a half ton. I mean, you gotta grab onto here, grab a foot on the, it doesn't look good. Okay, so you got the step. Now the step makes a lot of sense because you kick it. And that's the only thing I noticed about the Fords is that this sucker's slippery. I mean, now it's slippery not to stand on, slippery to actually get it to come out. But once you get it out, as you can see, makes a lot of sense for getting up onto the bed. And you can load things in, makes your life a lot easier. And as we mentioned, not slippery when you get up there. Well, it's time for us to take a look inside the expanse of this super cab. And you know, it's interesting. We have yet to have a super cab come through the fleet over the last three years, as well as one in the lower trims, the, the cloth trims. And I have to tell you, when it comes to a truck, I want to have a cloth interior that actually doesn't look like I'm going to rip it with the rivets of my jeans. This is sturdy. It's, it's very well put together, very robust. I like that. Now, 
the other thing about the inside is you want to have places to put your stuff. Um, I'm assuming out here in Alberta we're going to have saddle gear and other cowboy things. Darn, don't we wish we had that kind of fun every day? Well, if you did have that kind of fun every day, you've got big gullies in the sides of the doors to go and put your stuff. The one thing I did notice, though, is that you don't have the, ow, soft trim for the rear doors, but you do have, oh, soft trim for the front doors. Uh, the other thing you should notice is that there is the adjustable anchors, so you can get the right comfort for the front seat outboard driver and passenger positions. But let me tell you about something that's just, oh, Lord, help me out here. Help me to understand why we still can't get seam sealer on the bottoms of the doors of the F-150. I'm going to be talking to the engineers and trying to figure that out as to why. Because it makes sense in the sense, if you're the sensible type of sense person, that rinses that out all the time. But if you're not, if you're the kind of person who thinks that, oh, sure, touchless car wash, I mean, this is going to solve all my problems. No, no, because this is where salt, grit, and grime is going to collect, and then you're going to start having corrosion issues. In fact, we've got something that looks like a corrosion issue already on a brand new truck. This needs to be addressed right away. And Ford knows how to do it right, because we've seen the type of seam sealing that can occur on some of the other vehicles, mostly global vehicles so keep that in mind when you're taking a look at anything Ford truck. We're really excited about the 2013 story. We were able to add new grills all across our lineup to add greater differentiation both from our XL and XLT um, more the, the basic trucks through the Lariats and the King Ranch and uh, our Limited that we're talking about here today. Um, so on the front end, you're getting a different appearance. It has more of that C-clamp style, that borrowing some cues from Super Duty, tough truck look. Uh, we've also added HID lamps, which I'm very excited about. They give a very modern appearance, and that's a, a segment exclusive to us. Uh, very modern appearance to the front end, um, as well as giving you a whiter and brighter look, um, uh, m better performing and longer, longer bulb life. Um, and we've added some great colors, like the ruby red exterior you see behind me. And on the interior, we've got a great story. We were able to add on uh, XLT, um, our my touch and our my Ford, excuse me, and on uh, the Lariats and, and above series, we were able to add our my Ford Touch. So this is bringing all the technology that cu that customers really expect in their vehicles into their trucks. Um, everything can be operated from touch screen or from voice commands um, or the hard buttons. And, and with the trucks, it was important to us to add the hard buttons because we know that we have folks who may have work gloves on um, or you know bigger hands that they they want to be able to use the hard knobs. So. Um, we've added a lot of technology on the interior for 13. Um, the My Touch gives you your Bluetooth capability, your um, complete voice commands, your uh, navigation system all integrated into your touch screen. Now, the other thing you're going to appreciate when you're using any truck in a truck-like sense is the abilities to move the seats around, configure them in such a way that you're able to put large items. Now, the F-150 in the Super Cab Edition that we have here in front of us, well, it's got some abilities and uh, you know we have to remember that there's only so much that we can do with the space that we're dealing with so we don't have the abilities for the seat backs to come down in any form of platform but we do have the abilities to flip the seat cushions up now this is important because the seat cushions do lock into place they're not going to be flopping around so if you want to put larger items in you can certainly go with the shorter side of the cushions I think that's about a 70 30 oh, it's new truck math. I, you know, anyway, this is the shorter side. That's the longer side. So you can configure it whichever way you need to put cargo in and keep things from rattling around. One of the things that you should know about when it comes to the F-150 is that this is not a clatter wagon in any way, shape, or form. It's one of the quietest trucks on the road. And when you think about all the heritage of Ford, when they used to put their Ford cars up against Rolls Royces and say that they were quieter, well, the, the quiet LTDs of the early 70s, they really understand what it means to make a quiet vehicle. And most importantly discovered today is that the 3.7 liter V6, it's one of the quietest running V6s you're ever going to run across when it comes to naturally aspirated. So make that a consideration when you're rolling up to the country club. 
Well, we're back down at Rude Rides Restorations, and you'll never guess who I ran into on his May Car Care Month journeys, and that's Bill Gardner from Motoring 2013. Bill, thanks for joining us on the road trip. We'll do the left-handed handshake like a Boy Scout here. Uh, yeah. yeah, thank you for having me out. Um, it totally works. It's, uh, it's great every year to get out and, you know, just get across the country and see some of the regional differences in car repair and what happens to a car in various parts of this country, and it's, it's always fun. I think the important thing to point out to a lot of our viewers is that when it comes to the problems that you experience on vehicles, uh, things such as the climate is going to play a big part. Oh, huge. You're, you're absolutely right. And, you know, interesting that you say that because before I start, started doing National Car Care Month, we've, we've been doing this 14 years now, um, before I started doing it, I kind of thought that around the Great Lakes, I'm in, I'm in the greater Toronto area, I kind of thought that we had the lock on rusted cars, you know. <laughs> And it turns out we don't, you know, because Atlantic Canada is, of course, much worse. They get a much more severe winter, more snowfalls, more road salt, and, and uh, you know, and they've got a bit of salt air from being on the coast, too. So, you know, the, the cars fatigue at a greater rate out there than they even do in southern Ontario. So, you know, it's, it's pretty amazing. And, and you know, the, the flip side of that coin, of course, is coming out to the prairies and seeing, uh, you know, an, an early 80s car driving around in Saskatchewan, and it's, it's you know, it wasn't restored or, or kept away. It's just driven every day, and it still looks good. Well, the other thing that also we need to talk about is the ugly side, and it has to do with the maintenance that a lot of people ignore. And now what you've brought in from your shop is the, the box of shame. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah, we've got a few steering and suspension components that came off jobs in my shop over the past few months, and I just kind of culled them out and brought them along because they're pretty graphic and they, they illustrate some of the things that happen. But, uh, you know, there's an example of a, a, a ball joint out of a Chevy pickup. Now, it had a grease fitting in it, but, you know, because grease fittings are not in many vehicles, when you take it in for service, the technicians aren't looking for them, so they kind of overlook them. So even if it had a grease fitting, there's a darn good chance it didn't get greased. And of course, this one didn't get greased, and you can see the ball stud is you know, very loose in this. It's worn badly, and you know, when you put that on the vehicle and then grasp the wheel and tire, you've got huge amount of play in this. So you know, the, it, it had uh, quite extreme negative camber. The toe is way out of whack, and it wears the heck out of tires. Uh, and this didn't provide a clunk or much other feedback to the driver of the vehicle, but you could certainly see it in the tires. It wore the heck out of the front tires. So definitely a good indicator, and it's important to note that a lot of the issues that may be occurring on your vehicle aren't going to present themselves with sounds, clunks, or shimmies. No, no. In, in fact, many modern vehicles can really hide some huge problems, especially if it's a big, robust vehicle like a, a full-size SUV. They can go down the road with brakes and suspension that are in terrible shape and really not give you a whole lot of feedback. A smaller, lighter car will give you more feedback and you will fill these things. But, you know, uh, there's an example of an upper ball joint out of another car. Now, no grease fitting in this, they, and that's the typical ball joint these days. You know, they're, they're what we call lube for life. So there's a finite amount of grease inside the, uh, the, the ball joint. Uh, there's a, a, a boot that keeps the grease in and, and the water out. And this component basically lasts as long as the integrity of that boot. As long as it keeps the grease in and water out, it lasts. And as soon as it gets compromised, it gets all rusty like this one and worn out, and you've got clunking and looseness and tire wear again. So, you know, it's this, these are the kinds of things that uh, you want to get looked at uh, on a regular basis on your car. But, you know, a lot of people service their car seasonally, so spring is definitely a good time to see what the heck happened to your car over the winter. Now this tie rod here, uh, let's talk about the play that you encountered on this one. Yeah, this came off a Nissan Quest minivan, Michael, and uh, when it drove in the shop I, and I grabbed the front wheels, and we always give the wheel a shake on anything that's lifted up, even if it's not in for a complaint like that, you just check it anyways. And it had a lot of lash in the steering linkage, it, it was just clunking like crazy. And the funny thing is, um, it was so worn, I thought, boy, it's ready to separate. And I just went around the boot with a little knife and it just went like that just came right apart. So the only thing keeping it together was, you know, the, the strength of the boot would kind of keep the ball stud centered up in this socket and the car would actually steer and drive in. I got to get myself some rubber boots by these guys. Holy cow. It, it was amazing. It, it was kind of shocking, but it's, it's just incredible what some of these vehicle, vehicles can soldier on with. But uh, here again, you know, no grease fitting and the, the grease got washed out. And this is something that can be picked up by a quick visual inspection every time the car's in. 
Now, how's about the, uh, the bushings on the vehicle? We uh, obviously think of the usual mechanical things. We've been certainly taught about the issues of ball joints and tie rods and, and McPherson struts. We, we know about all the big stuff, but what about the bushings? Yeah, the suspension bushings, uh, here's a real great example of a current car that just seems to be, you know, probably if, if, you, if I thought about uh, any one car that comes in my shop dominantly right here and now with a suspension bushing gone is a Chevy Cobalt or a Pontiac Pursuit, the, the um, small front wheel drive GM cars. And this, uh, this is a lower control arm bushing out of one of those cars. So when this is new, Michael, the, the rubber bushing, some, of the, some mechanics call this the hockey puck and you can see why. Um, this rubber bushing would be securely bonded inside of this metal sleeve and in the center part of this bushing, this steel sleeve, which pulls out now, uh, would be tightly bonded to the middle part of this bushing. And so this rubber bushing isolates the control arm from the chassis of the, the vehicle, and that rubber, the cush of that rubber, soaks up a lot of the harshness, uh, noise of vibration harshness that would be transmitted into the vehicle, and it gives you a nice ride. Now, when this bushing fails, and it often does on those cobalts and pursuits, the, the complaint for the, for the customer will be, you know, as they pull into a driveway or go over a curb, there's a big bang or clunk in the front end. And it's usually as you're just, just pulling in, say, into your driveway or into a parking lot. That's when you hear it the most. And it's basically, it's the control arm, which is no longer centered in between the chassis now. It drops and bangs against the bottom, or it tops out and bangs against the top, and you'll hear that banging around. So it's, uh, it's a pretty inexpensive bushing, a little bit of labor to change it, and a wheel alignment afterwards, but uh, it gets the car fixed up and working really well. And these bushings, Michael, are uh, interesting in that when they're, they're new and they're bonded together, when you put it in the car, you want to make sure that when you, as a mechanic, when you tighten all the fasteners up related to this, that the suspension is underweight, it's loaded, and it's in its normal ride height position. Because the function of this bushing, the, the engineers refer to it as a torso elastic bushing, so a lot of, there's a lot of effect to this bushing that's similar to a shock absorber. So when you clamp it down in its normal ride height position, when it twists this way or that way, it wants to use its memory of the cush of the rubber, the springiness of the rubber, to, to twist its way back to center each time. So you want to be careful as a mechanic not to tighten all the fasteners up on this with the suspension hanging down. So it, it shouldn't be up on the hoist with the wheels hanging when you tighten this. So you do your final tightening laying on your stomach on the ground uh, with the car, you know, maybe on ramps or whatever, but weight on the suspension, normal ride height when you tighten this up. And then, now you've got it centered, and every time it twists a little bit si either way of center, it wants to fight its way back to the center, and, and that rubber has almost as much effect as a shock absorber. Well, that's a great tip for the technicians that are watching. And I'm just taking a look at this other uh, uh, bushing here, and, uh, well, it seems as though it's disintegrated. Yeah, that's an inner tie rod bushing from uh, a Chrysler Intrepid. So this would be used in any of those uh, LHS chassis uh, and Intrepid uh, chassis that are, were a really good front-wheel drive car, and there's still a lot of them on the road. They were built in Bramley, Ontario. Great cars. Uh, that's, in effect, your inner tie rod on those cars. Um, it, it's quite different than other cars, and this this is uh, this this bushing meets up against the uh, steering rack, and a bolt goes through it, and that bushing eventually wears out. Now this takes huge kilometers. You know, you you, you won't get an Intrepid in with this bushing worn out with less than 200,000 k on it. It's it's going to be north well north of 200 k. But I do get them in the shop quite often, and uh, you know, it's it's a lot of labor to change it. It's it's. Um, the first few times you do it, it's difficult to get at, but uh, it's fairly inexpensive on the parts side. And of course, you know, once you're done, you've made a big improvement in the steering of the car and, and your tire wear situation as well. Well, the one thing that I, th I think gets overlooked a lot by people, and it's I've seen some of the horror stories when it comes to the flexible brake lines on vehicles, and looks as though you've got one of them in front of us. Yeah, yeah, this is a front brake flex hose that would be typical of you know, just to be any car or light truck on the road today. And, you know, this, this brake flex hose, as the name implies, allows the front wheels to twist and turn, to steer left and right and go up over bumps. And still we can have the, the hydraulic brake pressure delivered through this hose to the front brake calipers. So, you know, this hose is, uh, is fixed here in a bracket, so it sort of concentrates the bend right there. And you can see that the fabric's showing on it right here. So uh, this one, you know, this is something you can pick up very easily visually just by pulling the wheels off and doing a tire rotation and 
you know, quick look, see, and you're going to spot things like this. This one hadn't burst, but uh, it certainly, you know, the writing was on the wall that that was very quickly going to happen. So you can replace this part, bleed the brakes, and uh, you're all set to go, and you never have that trauma of losing the brake pedal. Well, one of the more involved traumas for an engine is the timing belt letting go. And there's so many factors that can occur to make that happen. And we've seen a lot of manufacturers now that must be certainly aware of the concerns that people have had with timing belts over the years. Much of the inexpensive four-cylinder cars that are available today have been moving to timing chains. But I want to ask you, Bill, should we be afraid of the timing belts and how should we respect them? No, you don't need to be afraid of it, just aware of it. Uh, and you're, you're absolutely right. There's more and more engines now with, with timing chains instead of belts. And I, and I think it, it, it probably, you know, I, I have never discussed this with an automotive engineer, but I suspect that it allows them, you know, different latitudes in design now. Uh, and, and there were a lot of cars that were built with timing belts where it was difficult to access it, you know, because of the way the engine was installed in the chassis. So it became a, a you know, a... 800 to a thousand dollar pit stop on a lot of cars and and it was considered quote unquote scheduled maintenance to replace the timing belt and people were getting fed up with it they really were that motors were pure fed up with it you know they'd they drive the car into the shop at eight in the morning with it running perfectly but it had 160k on it and it was due you know for a timing belt by the maintenance manual for the car and they drive out at six o'clock a thousand dollars lighter in the wallet Engine still ran the same as when they came in this morning, and you just took a thousand bucks off them for a timing belt, water pump, some pulleys, and a whole lot of labor. Just wasn't, it's not an easy sell. So I'm glad to see them gone, but you know, certainly it's nothing to be afraid of. If your vehicle's so equipped, uh, it's nothing to be afraid of, and, I, and it wouldn't be the deal breaker on, on what I buy or you know, how I select a vehicle necessarily. But uh, if, if I had two cars I was looking at and it was a dead heat, it might tip the decision. You know, it's, it's, cer certainly, uh, it's certainly something to be aware of. So this, this one, Michael, is um, from a Honda Civic. And uh, this, this particular car, the water pump seized up. You can see that it rotates, you know, a couple of degrees and then it just locks. So the minute that water pump locks up, of course, the timing belt is, uh, is cogged or keyed right to it and it, it just snaps the timing belt instantaneously and it doesn't matter if that belt was brand new a month old a week old it's going to break it so um, it's and, and that's usually you know what we find it's it's very seldom that a car comes in uh, where the belt just fatigues and breaks all by itself we do get the odd car like that but it's usually one of the one of the accessories that's driven off the belt that precipitates it failing now, if people want to find out more about tips that they need to know for taking care of their vehicle properly, what's the best way to find this out on the web? Well, uh, the Car Care Canada website has some great tips. Uh, on our motoringtv.com website, you can see anything that I've done over the years. You can reference shows from years and years ago. And, you know, if you go through the library there, the index, you'll, you'll see that, um, you know, each show is titled so you can get a bit of an idea what we talked about. Uh, there's so many things. I mean, you just Google the problem that you've got and all kinds of stuff comes up today. It's incredible what you can do on the Internet. Well, definitely good places to go and good tips from, as far as I'm concerned, Canada's best wrench. Bill, want to thank you for joining us on the road trip. Thank you so much for having me out, Michael. It's always fun. Thank you.